The first annual Reardon IBC and Cancer Symposium proudly presents this special presentation. The Optimization of Vitamin C and Antioxidant Therapy. Your presenter, Thomas Levy, MD. Okay, without further ado, the uh, keynote address tonight is by Dr. Tom Levy. And, um, I, can't, uh, I can't agree more with, with Ed Wernicke that uh, Tom, Tom Levy's books have been an inspiration to me. Um, I uh, had the good fortune of participating in a roundtable discussion with him online that got published, uh, on the phone that got published, and I was just struck with the crispness and clarity of his thinking, and I'm, he, he's a very well-grounded uh, individual as a cardiologist and as an attorney, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that he, he was willing to come so far to be with us tonight and to give us our keynote address on the optimization of vitamin C and antioxidant therapy. Would you please welcome Dr. Thomas Levy. Well, after those preliminaries, uh, I, I think I have to add dancing to my number. <laughs> Let me first say I'm extraordinarily pleased and humbled to be speaking to a group like this uh, at this first conference in honor of Dr. Reardon. Uh, Dr. Reardon, indeed, was very much a pioneer right along the lines of Linus Pauling and Frederick Leonard. <clears throat> Actually, it wasn't until today that I realized how long ago Dr. Reardon started with his IV vitamin C therapies in the mid-70s. And he was really the link that kept the work of Dr. Klenner from functionally dying. And probably as of 10 years ago, other than this clinic, I don't know that there was a large amount of it going on in the country or in the world. But there's been a small groundswell slowly growing of usage through ACAM and some other organizations. And I'm extremely surprised and delighted to see such a wonderful cross-section, not only of the United States, but uh, of the world for a relatively small group, but a very potent, energetic, and intellectual group. Uh, you represent, in my opinion, <clears throat> maybe not shared by many other mainstream ph physicians, but uh, you're the elite of the elite. What you're doing is top-notch. It involves a large amount of integrity and, in many ways, a minimization of income. So, <clears throat> interestingly, when I finally sat down on my computer to start putting things together, everything's PowerPoint these days, <clears throat> I wasn't precisely sure where I was going or how I was going to get there. But I had a few ideas in mind, and I started going in one direction. And then I said, well, no, you have to add this. And well, no, it's not going to be complete if you don't mention that. And by the time I finish this, I have now the outline for what I plan to be my next book. <laughs> And it will be entitled, Reversing the Irreversible. Okay. All right. Now, it's good to have theories, but theories are only really good when they work in a functional clinical model. So I'm going to propose to you tonight... And it was largely started by the discoverer of vitamin C, <clears throat> Dr. Albert St. Georgie. But I think we've added some more information since then. And that is the true physical concept and reality of electron flow. Now, I can't tell you functionally or practically if electrons are flowing. I don't think anybody's ever seen one. But 
I can tell you what I'm going to present to you right now, so far in my clinical experience, applies to every situation that I've seen. And if something can plug into a theory and produce results, and you can base therapies based on that and result in predictable results, it's a pretty good working theory. Now, what Dr. St. Georgie originally contributed back <clears throat> in the 70s was the fact that electron flow and supply, when you look at this, a high flow or supply equals health, a low supply illness, a cessation of flow death. It sounds pretty simplistic, but bear with me and I think you'll see the tremendous applicability of this concept. Now, we talk about nutrition, and there's no doubt good nutrition is great, but why? All good nutrients are ultimately antioxidant. All antioxidants are nutrients. I'm not talking about a rough, roughly, they are equal. The ability to donate electrons means it's a nutrient. The ability to take electrons away means it's a toxin. Interchangeability. Okay, is it isn't like well, one of the characteristics of a toxin is this, or one of the characteristics of a nutrient is this. If something has nutrient capacity in your body, it is working at the molecular level as an antioxidant and ultimately donating electrons and contributing to the very fuel that runs your body. Conversely, when at the molecular level it takes electrons away, it is toxic and it is synonymous with a toxin of all variety. So all nutrient substances donate electrons, all toxic substances deplete electrons. To my knowledge yet, no exceptions. <clears throat> now toxins. When I was initially doing the research for my vitamin C book, Curing the Incurable, vitamin C, infectious diseases, and toxins, <clears throat> I already knew from a, practical <clears throat> from a practical point of view and from reading Dr. Klenner's work that a large dose of vitamin C infused neutralized a wide array of toxins very effectively. Snake bite, barbiturates, uh, radiation poisoning, <clears throat> heavy metals, you name it. And I said, how can one simple molecule neutralize the effects of such a wide, diverse, different family of molecules? How can that be? I knew it happened, but I started doing the research before I understood where I was going. Well, as it turns out, it's simply whether or not you're donating or receiving electrons. That's it. It's that simple. <clears throat> All toxins are prooxidants. All prooxidants are toxins. Okay. <clears throat> Expanding slightly on this, all symptomatology <clears throat> and basically any disease process, what bothers you about a disease process is symptomatology. If you're not symptomatic, you don't really care. All symptoms are induced by toxins or prooxidants, electron depletion. <clears throat> All nutrients and antioxidants replete electrons and is by that mechanism that you get pain relief or that you get resolution of any particular symptom process. And it's literally that simple. <clears throat> now, more specifically with vitamin C and toxins. It's really been proven against all toxins tested. In my book, I looked in the literature in well over a hundred different toxins. 
<clears throat> so if there exists a toxin out there somewhere that vitamin C doesn't affect, I don't know what it is, and I seriously doubt that it exists. Now, all antioxidants are antitoxins. Why is vitamin C so especially good? Vitamin C is arguably the most successful because of its water solubility, its very simple molecular structure, and its ready ability, how well and easily it gives up two electrons per molecule. And the prooxidant side of vitamin C, DHAA, I got a kick today out of the study the, the researcher did using DHAA as a representative of vitamin C. I mean, that's like, uh, that's like using your waste products as a representation of you. <clears throat> not, not very complimentary. <clears throat> I mean, to say that that entire experience was beyond brain dead is too complimentary. <clears throat> now, glutathione and toxins, another important concept, and actually our remarkable layperson with the experience that he went through today, I was very impressed with what he said in particular, and I thought he was plagiarizing me, except he never heard me say it. And that is, what's important is your antioxidant pool. Okay? All antioxidants donate electrons. It's just a question of how efficiently they donate them, how their unique biochemical structure gets them into a certain tissue more than the other. Vitamin C is fat, uh, vitamin E is fat soluble and stays in the membranes of the cells. Yet vitamin C on the outside and the inside and glutathione will come along and donate electrons to vitamin E to keep it in the reduced state so that it protects the membranes from lipid peroxidation. So the pool is important. And as gung-ho as I will appear about vitamin C and glutathione and antioxidants such as this, it's not to the detriment of any other antioxidant. The better, higher quality and diverse representation of your antioxidants that you can get into your body, headlined by vitamin C and glutathione, the better. <clears throat> now vitamin, uh, excuse me, GSH is especially important because it's the ruler of the inside of the cell. It's got extremely high concentrations inside the cell, several fold higher than outside. <clears throat> it does everything a good antioxidant is supposed to, plus neutralizes toxins. In some cases, it will directly chelate. Chelate means to directly bind to a toxin, not only donating electrons, but rendering it non-toxic by virtue of the fact of, by making a new complex, if you will, a new molecule. And it has intracellular synthesis. Now, this is one fact, I think, that is little recognized about glutathione, but to me ex explains a great deal about what the divine creator might have been thinking about when he made the cell. What do all antioxidants do when they, after they donate their electrons. They become toxins. They're then looking for electrons. And unless you have a mechanism where your expended antioxidants are rapidly pushed into a pool and excreted, you start, you start sitting in the middle of your own cesspool. <clears throat> Well, guess what? Glutathione, to my knowledge, if there's any other exceptions that somebody can think of, let me know, is the only antioxidant that does not become a prooxidant when you take the electrons away. Because the oxidized form 
of the glutathione turns on itself and binds together, forming GSSG bound at the sulfhydryl groups, and it doesn't take electrons away. It doesn't have any to give, but it's not taking any away, so you're not turning the inside of your cell into a toxic little cesspool. A very elegant design. <clears throat> now, we talk about antioxidant pools. And <laughs> this, is, this is by far an exclusive list because really what I was talking about earlier is everything you take inside your body, when it gets ultimately metabolized and brought down to the molecular level, it's going to do one of three things. It's going to give up an electron, it's going to take an electron away, or in extremely rare circumstances, it's going to be electronically inert and do neither. There's really no other options. Now, some of the most prominent antioxidants, we talked about C and glutathione. Vitamin E, extremely important because it's fat-soluble and gets into your cell walls as your primary protector. The carotenes, alpha-lipoic acid, we've heard a fair amount today. Coenzyme Q10. And acetylcysteine, not only because it helps to support intracellular glutathione levels as a precursor, <clears throat> but there's a lot of evidence to show that N-acetylcysteine in its own right will directly bind and neutralize toxins in the blood. Uh, for example, if you're at a dental appointment and you're getting your mercury taken out, amongst other things, it's very good to take several grams of N-acetylcysteine because it will help bind up any mercury that gets immediately released into your bloodstream. Silymarin and silibin, and I just throw those in because of their unique biochemical structure. They like to and go and concentrate in the liver. <clears throat> All right. Now, <clears throat> we're going to have a long sequence of slides with the same heading, Prominent Promoters of Chronic Degenerative Diseases. Now, to be sure, this is a cancer conference. Well featuring cancer as a disease process. And that's fine, but I'm going to tell you that everything that I'm going to tell you tonight is not only, in my opinion, clinical opinion, scientific opinion, optimal for the treatment of cancer, it's also optimal for the treatment of any other chronic degenerative disease. This is because all disease ultimately focuses on the health of your cell. Do you have intracellular health or not? If you do, you don't have disease. If you don't, you have any of a wide variety. <clears throat> so anything you can do that can improve the intracellular metabolism is going to lessen and diminish whatever disease process you're looking at. And depending on the disease, in some cases, God forbid, you might actually cure it. Okay, now, <clears throat> infections are enormously noxious to your body because they just produce toxins all over the place. They have endotoxins. Sometimes the core of the bacterial or viral body is toxin in and of itself. Exotoxins, they'll sometimes secrete substances that are toxic. As they do their little... Like their, like their many bodies, they have their own extracory mechanisms and they make waste byproducts and these are highly toxic as well. And all of these things have been well documented to consume antioxidant and promote inflammation. Now, so you have infections. Number two, you have all the known exogenous toxin exposures. Uh, we were talking earlier today that <clears throat> And I, I thought I was the only one that made this observation, and I was talking to Dr. Honeyhacky, and he'd, he'd made the same uh, observation, and that is, we both don't doubt what Klenner did was valid, but relative to what we need to use now, he seemed to use so little vitamin C to get the results that Klenner got. Roughly, it seems like you have to use 25 to 30 to 35 percent more vitamin C than he did. 
and I'm not sure of a reason for this, but I think as good an explanation any is 50 years after Dr. Klenner, the average body on planet Earth has a heck of a lot more toxins it needs to neutralize before it can get to the starting point to deal with what the new exposure is that you're trying to negate. <clears throat> Dietary toxin exposures. It's important to understand that there's many ways that you can introduce toxins into your body and whether a diet is good for you or bad for you is not just the quality of the food. It's not that simple. A constipated gut. A constipated gut has clostridium bacteria flourishing in it. The longer it takes to process food, the more it goes to the rotting and putrefaction side of digestion rather than to proper processing and assimilation. And the more rotting and putrefaction takes place, your clostridium, like clostridium botulinum, produce the most toxic substances so far that medicine has ever discovered. So, and what promotes that? Not only choice of food, but something that's little emphasized is food combinations. Pavlov, a Nobel Prize winner way back when, in the early 1900s. He did dog experiments, and when he would put carbohydrate, direct carbohydrate into the stomach of a dog, nothing else, it would process it and push it through in 90 minutes. When he put ground up meat inside the stomach by itself, it would take longer, it would process it in about three hours and push it through the pylorus. Now, any takers for how long that stomach would take to empty when he put the carbohydrate and the meat together? Eight to nine hours. The way we eat is not the optimal way to eat. Now, I'm not going to say don't enjoy your meals and combine everything else, but if you're looking to optimize your health, if you have bowel movements where nobody wants to come close to the bathroom for a half an hour after you leave, this is why. Proper food combinations assure you that, that you have a gut motility so that you have a bowel movement roughly twice a day or more. If you're having it less than once a day, that's bad, and if you're one of the unfortunate souls that have it every two or three days, enormous toxin exposure. And you need to address that, number one, if you expect to get on top of whatever health problem you're addressing, cancer, heart disease, chronic degenerative disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, you name it. <clears throat> Toxic iron status. We dropped, talked about this a little bit today. Iron and copper, okay? I'm not too sure you can become copper deficient. I, that's, that's, that's so toxic in my opinion, I'm, I'm very reluctant to ever recommend any form of copper supplementation and, until I see a documented case of somebody having a pure copper deficiency with a lot of symptoms and a copper supplement improving that, I would steer away from it as a supplement for the same reasons that you steer away from iron. <clears throat> I'll discuss a little bit more how we address these things. Right now, I want to outline the most common different toxin problems we run into. <clears throat> Poor vitamin D status, a strong promoter. Uh, and this needs to be monitored by blood levels. This is probably, in addition to a number of other points, what makes vitamin D so unique is it's almost the only vitamin or nutrient or supplement that you really have to monitor with blood levels because too much is as bad as too little. You don't want either situation. Either situation will lead to increased cancer. Toxic calcium status. Okay, we're going to see, and I'm going to discuss this a little bit more. Not only do 
unneutralized toxins in your body, and this was established by uh, Melvin Page many years ago, severely alter your calcium-phosphorus ratio. Once they do, it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to normalize calcium metabolism in your body and keep calcium from depositing in your blood vessels and organs like stalactites and stalagmites in a, in a cave. And that's not a bizarre example because, believe it or not, the type of calcium that deposits out in your body is chemically identical to the stuff that deposits out inside caves. So this is real chemistry, but it's just inside your body rather than the cave. Anyway, this is something that needs to be addressed. I'll give you a sequence of things that you can do, and we'll talk about that more. <clears throat> genetic predisposition. Just starting to see now that there's some genetic testing that can be done that can point to a predilection in your case. I mean, if 100 people are exposed to the same high toxin level, uh, 10 will get diabetes, 10 will get hypertension, 10 will get kidney disease, half a dozen will get cancer, and all with the same exposure. So there are genetic predilections that make you susceptible more to one type of disease than another. <clears throat> Inadequate or poor supplementation has a most, more to do with bioavailability than anything else, and we'll discuss this at some length. It doesn't make sense to take the best supplements in the world if they're not getting precisely where you want them to get. And I'm not just talking about in the blood, even further. <clears throat> okay. Uh, there's probably a number of you that haven't been exposed to what I'm about to tell you now. Do, do you have seat belts in these chairs? Okay. Please, please, uh, do we have a little film that we, oh, okay, all right. That, they do that in the airlines. We don't need to do that here. Okay. I spent an enormous amount of time with Dr. Hal Huggins. That's what got me into all of this stuff back in 1993, 94. <clears throat> and I saw a large number of patients. Whoa. Goodbye. I saw a large number of patients who had severe advanced chronic degenerative disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's disease, and uh, Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> I got to give credit to Dr. Huggins for that one. That was his favorite one. <clears throat> and these were all diseases that aren't supposed to get better under any circumstances. Well, I saw them get better. On rare occasions, I saw them virtually disappear. And on even rarer occasions, I saw complete resolution. One of his most famous cases was an MS patient, wheelchair bound, that after the dental toxins were removed, and the proper diet was started, the proper supplements were taken, and this is no exaggeration, the guy was running triathlons. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that's a model that you're going to get with every patient, but the point is that these diseases are reversible. Okay? Now, we've talked about how toxic infections are. Okay, number one on your list, in my opinion, if you're treating any cancer patient, especially cancer, heart disease, but all of the degenerative diseases, but we're talking about cancer here. If you do everything that you know good for a patient and you leave a root canal, treated tooth inside their mouth, you haven't done the most important 90% of what you can do for that patient's health. Okay, I, and I even had, although there was a lot of this stuff I felt to be true in theory, but I didn't have the clinical cases to show. One individual has no problem with me telling this story, and it's good to tell stories. They put a little pulp into something. This individual, about three years ago, four years ago, had what I call malignant fulminant atherosclerosis. He was narrowing down blood vessels 
He had four or five stents put in. He was getting angiograms every few months and having chest pain all the time. And he said, well, Tom, what do I do? And I said, well, you're taking incredibly good supplements now. You're taking plenty of vitamin C. You're taking all the things that I think are good. We got to get to your mouth. There's got to be something there. And unless you sit, unless you're living next to a toxic industrial plant, there ain't nothing that's going to be as toxic in your body as bad teeth. They're number one on the list. So I said, come on down to Colorado. Let's get everything checked out. He came down. He had so much chest pain the night before. He said, Tom, let's not do it. Let's not. That's what I said. <laughs> I said, you're crazier than hell. You could die tomorrow if you want, but you're in Colorado. We're getting your mouth taken care of. I brought him to my favorite dentist in Colorado Springs. No, not Dr. Huggins. Another dentist. Dr. Huggins doesn't practice it anymore. He preaches it. And as fate would have it, he had one root canal. Some other minor dental problems, but one root canal. I said, well, I said, the treatment is clear. Get that SOB out and now. And as they do, you do a cleaning process to get all the infected bone out, too. He never had another chest pain after that. And he had a complete reversal of the narrowings that he had in his arteries. My other main book, Stop American Number One Killer, which is based on largely on what Dr. Pauling and Dr. Rath started, is coronary artery disease is focal arterial scurvy. And when you have something in your mouth, most prominently a root canal, that, let me tell you, they're 100% infected. Don't let any dentist tell you they're not. If they're not 100% infected, I can tell you it's 99.999 because well over 5,000 consecutive root canals that we saw extracted were analyzed and 100% were highly toxic and had toxins that measured against different enzymes were in some cases a hundredfold more toxic than botulism. Now, what do they do? They embalm the tooth in situ. God forbid you're going to lose a body part, so they leave it there dead. They carve out the nerve and the blood supply. Do you have any idea how the immune system gets to something? Nerve and blood supply. But there's just a big gaping hole filled with artificial material. Now, let's skip to the chase. It's infected. It's making these toxins, these anaerobic toxins. Every time you chew on it, that occurs a few times every day. You express these toxins into the venous blood around the mouth and then the bone. Now, a little circulation lesson. Something that gets released into your venous system immediately goes to the lungs, the pulmonary circulation, down into the left atrium, left ventricle, and what's the first artery those toxins meet? that takes 25% of your blood supply. The two coronary arteries sitting on top of the aortic valve. So they get the highest dose of any dental toxins, any inflammatory products, any cytokines, anything that's produced in your mouth. And we have very clear papers from the other side, mainstream medicine, that have no qualms with telling you dental toxicity, periodontal disease, which is another Chronic infection is highly associated with heart attacks and cardiac mortality. Ooh, it's okay. <clears throat> I'm getting a little excited. <laughs> now, similarly, periodontal disease. So, conclusion here. If you take nothing else away from this, please remember that you have not come close to doing everything you can for whatever cancer patient you have if you let them leave your office or your clinic without making it clear 
that they need to get rid of their root canals by someone competent to take them out and clean the socket and allow healthy bone to grow back into place. Very important. Forget everything else, but remember that. Well, remember everything else if you can, but remember that. Periodontal disease, as you get these toxins inside the gum, a bad periodontal disease can be like having a dozen root canals. But periodontal disease, probably no periodontologist here, huh? Okay. A few dentists? Well, they'll, they'll like this. Periodontal disease, and I've done this several times and it amazes me how easy it is. Do you know how you cure periodontal disease, even advanced periodontal disease, where you've lost the little peak of gum tissue that's nice and flat and you have big spaces? Water pick hydrogen peroxide. They'll bleed like the Dickens the first two or three days, and for all but the most advanced cases, you'll see new gum tissue growing in a week. Just clean them right. And cleaning them right is not floss. Floss is, is gingival trauma. Okay? In uh, amounts, you buy a water pick, standard, gradually increase the pressure, throw in two or three capfuls of regular oil, 3% hydrogen peroxide, a splash of whatever your favorite mouthwash is, and you'll be cooking. Toxic dental metals, we've all heard about mercury, not good for you. Also, other things they use like nickel, one of the most highly carcinogenic, carcinogenic metals there is, they put in your mouth routinely. Okay? Cavitations, the routine way. Dr. Huggins got a kick out of this when I said, well, it's it's a mere extraction. Don't they know how to do a mere extraction? He said, well, you've obviously never done any extractions. I said, well, that's true. But they routinely pull out the tooth, wait for the bleeding to stop, and send you home. But they don't take out the periodontal ligament. It's a little ligamentous suspensory capsule that the tooth sits in inside the jawbone. Now, it wouldn't be natural for the jawbone to grow into the tooth. It has to have a biological way of signaling that the tooth is still there. Well, that's called the periodontal ligament. As long as the periodontal ligament is there, the bone is not going to have its natural trigger to grow in and fill that hole. Instead, it will creep over the top and uniformly leave you with an intoxic, toxic, infected, necrotic hole called a cavitation. I did a review of Huggins' charts, and we published a paper on this, and well over 90% of all patients who had wisdom teeth removed, even 10, 15, 20 years later, had easily identical toxic holes that when we did the pathology on them, were filled with the most enormously toxic anaerobic bacterial toxins you've ever seen in your life. So. It's not a complicated situation dentally, but you need a dentist that's aware of it and doesn't want to make fun of you for suggesting it. Abscesses. Never mess around with an abscess. I've seen, I've seen abscesses, in my opinion, uh, turn into fatal atherosclerotic narrowings and heart attacks very short order, days to weeks. So if you've got an abscessed tooth, get it pulled out yesterday. There's really, and, and, and you, you, don't, you don't save them by draining the abscess unless it's an abscess of the gum. If it's an abscess that involves the pulp of the tooth, uh, it's, it's going to watch you go to your grave. <clears throat> teeth cleaning. This brings up an enormously interesting case. I won't tell you how routine it is. I don't know. But I'll tell you that about... Seven years ago, Dr. Huggins and I got a call from a doctor in North or South Carolina, and we're in Colorado Springs, and he said, what do I do? I said, well, what happened? He said, well, I have a 24-year-old girl who got her teeth cleaned two weeks ago, 
And she's progressively lost all function and gone into a coma since then. I said, you got to be kidding. He said, no. I said, well, ship her on over. And she had mercury levels out the ceiling. We did vitamin C's. We did different forms of chelation. And very, very slowly, over the next three to four months, she regained full function. But when you buff these amalgam surfaces and you do any sort of proper photography, mercury starts pouring off of those things like crazy in the form of gas. Okay. Heavy metal exposure. You follow this with blood and hair analysis, history of environmental exposure. One thing you want to do in minimizing toxins, you want to get toxins out, but you don't want to burn down the house to kill the roaches. Okay? Detoxification is also retoxification. You can't get something toxic out of your body in large amounts without it having a renewed toxic effect in many tissues on the way. So, I have a little protocol, vigorous protected detoxification. Every now and then you're going to run into someone who you can identify through your testing that their levels of X, Y, or C, lead, mercury, you name it, are sky high. And you want to get them out in a month or two, not in five or ten years. And many people have levels that if you just do normal things that facilitate normal cellular excretory mechanisms, supporters, they're going to take five, ten years or longer. Because we've tracked these things on hair analysis and even with quality supplementation and support and diet, the body just doesn't bounce back that quick unless you accelerate the way to get it out so that the cell can recover. And that's one of the paradoxical things we'd see with a total dental revision is when most people would get all the stuff taken out, done right, they'd start getting a little sicker because they started dumping toxins rapidly. And they dump toxins rapidly because, it's sort of a catch-22, the more toxins you have in your body and your cells, the less efficiently the detox mechanisms inside the cell are going to work. So toxins tend to accumulate rather than excrete. But you take this huge exogenous load out of the mouth and all of a sudden the cell breathes a sigh of relief and starts dumping toxins like crazy. You've got to be prepared for this and give your patient a lot of support because they're not going to think you're a very good doctor while, you're feeling, while they're feeling sick. <clears throat> Vigorous protected de detoxification. Uh, you have many other ways to detox. I'll say Dr. Dr. Gordon has many good ways too. These are ways, I'm telling you, when you've identified a super high load and you want to get them out in short term, and again, you don't, don't want to destroy the body in the process of your enthusiasm. DMPS. Many people hate it. Many doctors hate it with good reason. If you give DMPS by itself, toxins come out so fast you get sick as a dog. I've seen an uh, early ALS patient go from no wheelchair to permanent wheelchair in a couple months after getting several DMPSs. Just because it's doing its job. It's getting toxins out like mad, but they're retoxifying the body. So, DMPS, DMSA, you do it with IV vitamin C. And you do enough vitamin C for enough days after the injection to cover the pharmacokinetics of excretion. You just do it the first day, they're going to get sick the second and third day. <clears throat> so if the detox symptoms break through, you increase IVC and hydration and continue several days more. Didn't have it when I first did this stuff, but the liposome encapsulated products, which we'll talk about, can give even more protection, protection because of getting your target antioxidant inside the cell and just not circulating in the bloodstream. Okay. Another good thing, far infrared sauna. Okay. Dietary toxicity. I don't want to minimize the topic, but I'll go through it fairly quickly. You want to promote a healthy gut, which I'm telling you is a bowel movement at least twice a day, or 
at least one and a half times a day. But just once a day, you're, you're not getting the job done. Now, water and chewing. Uh, the most important thing you can do for good digestion, believe me, is not your choice of food, but how long you chew it. It's simple, but elegant and true. You know, graze. Don't... Oh, I'm going to do that again, aren't I? <laughs> graze. Don't engulf it all in five minutes. <clears throat> Enzymes, food combinations I told you about. I wrote another book just about this, Optimal Nutrition for Optimal Health. Amounts. You can perfectly well digest one, two, or maybe three ounces of meat, but you're not going to perfectly digest 16 ounces. It ain't going to happen. And what happens to all the meat that doesn't get digested? It rots and putrefies. It has no other option. And what does that rotting and putrefaction do? Toxic bacteria, toxic endotoxins. All this is linked. See the pattern here. You have the toxins on one side, you have the antioxidants on the other. The lower you can make the toxins and the higher you can make the antioxidants is your ticket to good and long-term health. Oh, uh, occasional C flush. We shouldn't, we shouldn't forget the importance of good old regular vitamin C. For several years, I would take a, a tablespoon or two vitamin C first thing in the morning, flush out everything, and be whistling clean for the rest of the day. It's a very healthy habit, but even if you don't get into that type of deal, I can tell you doing a C flush, especially if you're a regular substantial amount meat eater, uh, and you don't leave the bathroom in a particularly good shape, uh, a sea flush every couple weeks is a very, very good way, far better in my opinion than any form of enema or uh, uh, irrigation system you can use. <clears throat> Iron toxicity. We heard about the Fenton reaction today. What I can tell you about iron toxicity is in my Stop America's number one killer book, we talk about iron as a risk factor, and it's very clear that where there's increased iron, there's increased oxidation, there's loss of antioxidants levels, there's focal coronary, there's focal arterial scurvy, and you get all these problems going on. Unless you're a menstruating woman, you should never supplement any form of iron. As I said earlier, I tend to feel the same way about copper, but for sure about iron. No man should ever take any iron in any form of supplementation. And contrary-wise, if you start making a routine on your cancer patients as well as your heart patients, all patients that come to see you, look at their ferritin levels. It's really hard to have a ferritin level that's too low. If you have a normal blood level, a normal hemogram, normal hematocrit, and you're male, it's hard to have an iron that's too low. This is sort of the official normal range, but I'm telling you that 300 shouldn't be any more than 75, 60, 50 tops. And by not addressing this, you're leaving a great source of antioxidant depletion, not only for the coronary arteries, but for any other chronic degenerative disease that you're trying to combat. <clears throat> uh, Deferoxamine is useful, to chelates iron really well, but who is it toxic? I, I have all of this information from personal experience, and uh, I, 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 when, when my vision started going wacky, I said, there's got to be a better way. <clears throat> and I found out about IP6, inositol hexaphosphate. Very easy, a more protracted period of time, but it, it gets... It's a very cheap, non-toxic, inexpensive way to mobilize iron and excrete it in most people that have elevated levels. <clears throat> Vitamin D status. Not too long ago, it was just thought that vitamin D regulated calcium, regulated absorption of calcium from your gut, and how well it was or wasn't deposited in bones, anti-osteoporosis. Well, not too long ago, maybe eight to ten years ago, 
they started looking and they started finding vitamin D receptors in virtually every tissue of the body. Well, why should vitamin C have receptors in every tissue of the body if its only important function or only function at all is regulating calcium absorption in your gut? Well, as it turns out, we have a lot of current literature now and vitamin D deficiency is associated with and an exacerbating factor and very likely causative. We just have the association so we can't 100% say it causes it, but very likely causes just about all variety of cancer, pancreatic, prostate, colorectal, bladder, breast, uterine, etc. Prostate is very interesting. I told you before about the toxicity of low vitamin D and the toxicity of high vitamin D. Both high vitamin D and low vitamin D are associated with elevated prostate cancer in individuals. So you do need to do the blood monitoring and not just be willy-nilly and assume that you're going to, with a certain amount of supplementation, get the right level in your patient. <clears throat> Other chronic degenerative diseases, not cancer, that vitamin D is strongly associated with, tuberculosis, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, scleroderma and collagen vascular diseases, psoriasis, Crohn's, schizophrenia, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, basically everything. And when you supplement vitamin D, use the D3, not the D2. Um, this slide, you know, can be subject to a lot of change over time goes on. I mean, I will tell you right now that the research in vitamin D is very dynamic. Uh, keep up with it. Uh, there can be significant changes, but they call the normal 30 to 74. Well, 30 is going to always be too low. This is uh, nanograms per cc. The, lev the top level could be higher, but a good safe target these days is 50 to 80. Some patients are going to need to take 10,000 units a day or more, but you don't want them on a dose like that indefinitely and without doing a follow-up test to make sure you haven't pushed them to 110, 120, 150 or more. Then you'll start ending up with increased cancer problems again and abnormal calcium metastatic depositions. Okay. Now, practical points on vitamin D deficiency. When you're looking to find an optimal level, you want to look at your indexes of calcium inside your body to see that the level of vitamin D3 in that patient, your patient, is not so much that it's having an abnormal calcium deposition problem in your body. I seriously doubt that 90 to 100 micrograms per cc is good for everybody. It's probably going to abnormally deposit in a few and be an ideal dose for the others. So in the midst of this testing, you need to look at coronary artery calcium. It's a fairly simple couple hundred buck test these days. It identifies quantitatively with a number the amount of calcium that's accumulating in your proximal coronary arteries. And I can tell you two things. Once you've got a test and there's calcium present, that's never normal, number one. The normal level of calcium inside your coronary arteries by this test is zero. So <clears throat> remember, any positive number is unacceptable as a therapeutic goal. Number two, you do these things by interval change. If you made a certain adjustment in D3, or as we'll talk about in calcium supplementation or no calcium supplementation, how do you determine it? I will say for most people, no calcium supplementation. But if you think they need some calcium, then I will tell you this. Give them whatever calcium you think you need, and I doubt that they need it, but verify that whatever amount that you have them on is not causing positive interval changes of further accumulation of calcium inside the coronary arteries. The worst thing you should do with a calcium artery score is keep it unchanged. 
you're definitely doing it wrong if it continues to increase or your patient is lying to you and they're not telling you about their quart of milk that they drink a day because they just couldn't give it up. <clears throat> so, uh, different ways to track calcium. I told you about the coronary calcium score. Other ways are important because if you do get the coronary calcium score to zero, you still haven't necessarily optimized the body's calcium status. They can still have substantially excess calcium in their body that you should try to mobilize. And you track this with hair analysis, echocardiography, in some cases fluoroscopy. Oh, wait. All right, so, yeah. Okay, other things to treat excess calcium. You identify toxins and eliminate them. I told you this is important for getting the calcium-phosphorus ratio normal. If your calcium is high and phosphorus is low, you start depositing calcium in the body. That's biochemically what happens. <clears throat> Bioavailable magnesium supplementation. Bioavailable, chelated to amino acids. Don't give somebody dolomite. Does anybody know what dolomite is? I, I used to, for purposes like this, bring it with me. It's a rock. Now, you know what they do? They grind that rock up into a fine powder and put it in a pillar capsule. I guess we could do that with this computer, too. Or this glass. You can grind anything up into anything, but it doesn't make it a nutrient or a supplement. So you need whatever magnesium you give, or calcium, if you choose to give it, in a bioavailable form. Not magnesium oxalate. Magnesium glycinate, aspartate, these are bioavailable forms. Vitamin K2 should be on the order of one milligram or more. Antioxidants. It's interesting about vitamin C, but vitamin C is such a master solubilizer of calcium that if you look outside the body and you have a, a standard solution of vitamin C, a very weak organic acid, and you have nitric acid, sulfuric acid, aqua regia, the vitamin C is going to put more calcium in the solution than those enormously potent acids. So this is all part of how vitamin C also works to help regulate your calcium metabolism if you give it a chance. Essential fatty acids, optimal vitamin D levels. <clears throat> okay, I said the modification on no calcium supplement is if you think some is indicated, fine, you're the doc, but document that the overall amount of calcium in your patient's body in terms of these tests I'm talking about is lowering over time. Now, I did a lot of this with Dr. Huggins, and, and <laughs> we didn't see anybody get better that, that couldn't get rid of the fondness for dairy, particularly in terms of drinking milk. I mean, if you want to cook stuff with dairy, uh, have a little yogurt every now and then, that's fine, but probably the best way to capsulize it is you eliminate milk as a beverage. Okay? And the type of milk makes a difference too. What do they do? Not only, well they used to have all the growth hormone in, maybe they're finally getting rid of that, <clears throat> but what else do they do? They put vitamin D in your milk. So you're putting the fuel and the ignition source in together so that they get abnormally absorbed levels of calcium every time you drink that type of milk. So if you do have milk, this is a good reason to get organic forms that haven't been screwed around with. Oh, proper antioxidant supplementation. <clears throat> okay, dose. We've talked a lot about dose. I know I'm taking a little long, but I had to relearn my problem about dose in a very traumatic way. <clears throat> Pardon me if I get teary again. <laughs> uh, I had a little baby min pin puppy. This thing weighed a third of a pound, a quarter of a pound. I, I could fit it in my pocket. And well, I, 
I think the damn vet gave him tummy disease because this, the next morning that I got the pup, he was fine walking around. The next morning I got up, he was flaccid. I thought he was dead. It all great. Well, I had with me a syringe and a little bit of liposomal vitamin C. And I pried his mouth open and got about a half a packet inside a body that weighs a quarter of a pound. So it was a rather large dose, to say the least. And, and he was still alive, so there was a little swallowing reflex and it went down. I uh, then just went over to my computer board and typed a little bit, and about an hour and a half to two hours later, the dog was walking around. From flaccid, a flaccid comatose puppy to walking around in two hours. I was so euphoric, I forgot everything Dr. Klenner ever taught me. Dose, dose, dose. I didn't continue. I didn't continue to give vitamin C for several more days. The dog was flaccid again in several more hours and I couldn't bring him back. But there was no doubt I had turned the corner if I'd been intelligent enough to remember the principles that I now preach. So dose, dose, dose. Without exception, if you're giving good antioxidants like vitamin C and glutathione, and you know they're being absorbed where you want, and you're not getting the clinical effect that you want, it's because you're not using enough. Root, IV, oral, rate. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the liposomes in a moment. Frequency is important, like with the puppy. You, early on, you've got to be very frequent. As the strength gets up, same thing with the patient. Okay. Everybody here knows how to mix up an IV. I'm not going to impose that on you. Now, something here to keep in mind for future research, okay? Pulsed intravenous vitamin C therapy. Now, I, I know I'm degenerating on these stories a little bit, but I got to tell you about seven years ago, at a point in time where I was very bored, I just finished reading and rereading some of Dr. Klenner's articles, and I read in one of his articles that in a patient that had an acute poisoning in the blood with low blood pressure, he whipped out his syringe and he gave, and this was a quote, pure 500 milligram per cc vitamin C as rapidly as a 20 gauge needle will allow. Well, that sounded pretty fast to me. So, I thought about this and I thought about this and I thought about this and I gotta say, I had a, probably a greater testic testicular mass than I had cerebral mass at that time. And I hooked up a butterfly and I, I said, well, I can't do this to anybody else until I try it myself. And I, and I butterflied myself in about five or six grams IV push. Pushed it in over a couple minutes. Well, I, I didn't notice anything happening, so I said, okay, step number one. And we were given lots of vitamin C at the time. And so I said, well, what about if we, we do this? a little bit more routinely, give a baseline of vitamin C and then give pushes on top to really, actually I think I was inspired by a lot of the work coming out of here where you're talking about high blood levels. And I said, well, how astronomically high can we get them with pulsed IV push vitamin C? And we got to a point, <laughs> thank God for the guardian angels above, but we got to a point where we would give an infusion of 50 to 100 grams over a three or four hour period. And in addition to that, we give three 20 gram IV pushes. And 
what I probably discovered after the fact rather than before the fact was that when you put a lot of vitamin C in the blood, the body reacts. And it reacts because it thinks there's a lot of glucose in the blood. Remember, vitamin C is synthesized from glucose, so the molecules are very similar. And what's your body going to do if it gets a flood of glucose in it? Insulin. The insulin is going to shoot up and the endogenous glucose level is going to go down. Well, I never got so esoteric as to measure the elevated insulin levels, but I can't conceive of any other way it happened. We documented, <clears throat> we documented, get a load of this, we documented blood glucose levels as low as 19 to 20. And we were able to maintain those levels for almost as long as we wanted. Now, in uh, insulin potentiated therapy, when you drop it with insulin without vitamin C circulating in the blood, you get it down to 45, maybe 40. The patient is going nuts. They can't take it after 10 minutes, and you got to bring them out of it. Well, in this case, we could keep people at a level of 20 to 25 for 15 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, bring them out with the D50. And based on everything that we're reasoning, is if everything we're saying about insulin potentiation therapy is true in facilitating entry into the cell of different things you're taking, well, you must be facilitating the heck out of it with this. And I called it a protected hypoglycemia. And we know earlier from the talk today, vitamin C gets to the brain quite well. And so during this period of time, your brain might prefer to have glucose circulating in it, but it's getting by on vitamin C. To my knowledge, we didn't, we didn't have any comatose patients when we were through. So, uh, ways to get out of it, you have your D50. Now remember, <laughs> as, as crazed as I was at the time, this is an investigational <laughs> type of application, so if, uh, if you do decide to go crazy, go slow and always have D50 around. Uh, and remember this. Remember the symptoms of profound hypoglycemia. Severe thirst, lightheadedness, drowsiness, headache, nausea, elevated blood pressure. And many of them will get none of this or just one or two of the symptoms. You know, so for goodness sakes, if you're doing this to somebody and all of a sudden their blood pressure shoots up, don't give them an antihypertensive drug, give them D50. Okay? Uh, See, so don't treat with symptom meds. Don't give them compazine for nausea. Don't give them uh, an analgesic for the headache. Treat the, treat the glucose. Now, practically speaking, it got to the point where we didn't want to do the pushes so much, but with a really large caliber needle and a concentrated bag that maybe had 50 to 75 grams and only 250 cc's, we were able to just let it infuse and get everything in in 30 minutes. And this would have pretty much the same effect on the blood sugar. Matter of fact, we learned how profound this effect was when was a time earlier when we weren't trying to do this. We just had an elderly lady that was in for an IV, vitamin C. Uh, she was pretty cachectic and weak. She got the vitamin C in several hours, about 50 grams. Then went home, and I found out the next day that they called our nurse, or somebody, the caretaker called the nurse and said, you got to come see her, she's not responding, blah, blah, blah. And fortunately, we had an extremely bright nurse who somehow figured out it was hypoglycemia and gave her D50, and she came right out of it. The point being is, one thing that's not described about high-dose vitamin C anywhere to my knowledge is that long after the fact, 10, 12 hours later, in a cachectic, cachectic person who's debilitated, you can still have a profound hypoglycemia. 
Don't forget this. It's a potentially severe long-term complication that, to my knowledge, has not been described anywhere, but I tell you it's real. And for, your, for your normal patients that aren't cachectic or wasted, you know, they have a little fruit juice, eat a little bit, no big deal. But in side effects and reactions, you always have to think about the potential extreme cases because those are the ones that are going to get the patient in trouble and get you in trouble. One very practical point, I, I don't know, I suppose everybody here has experienced this, but I never heard it talked about. God, especially with concentrated IV, concentrated vitamin C solutions, I've never had, in my patients as well, but I've never had such severe pain in my life as when a little bit of the vitamin C got outside the vein, I wanted to cut my arm off. And not only that, it took 45 minutes to an hour to go away. So, just as a practical point, be really good about your, uh, about your needle placement and maintenance of the IV. Now, the pulsed IV vitamin C therapy, you can give a wide variety of meds. An important concept here, though, I think it's going to be most effective for nutrients, things that are antioxidant, because... If you give a chemotherapy drug, anybody who's so inclined to do that, that's pro-oxidant, you have a high dose of vitamin C in the blood and it's going to just knock that out. It's going to neutralize it long before it ever gets absorbed. So you'll probably absorb inert chemotherapy. But if there's other nutrient antioxidants circulating in the blood, it stands to reason you should substantially increase intracellular uptake. Okay. That's why I said antioxidants and nutrients should benefit the most from this approach. Liposome encapsulation. I really think that this can be a major advance for your cancer therapy. Address dental toxicity. I told you how important that is. But what do you want to do with your antioxidants? You want to get them inside the cell. Now, in the case of an IV infusion, much of it naturally gets absorbed into the cell in its oxidized form, DHAA. So, in order to increase your intracellular capacity, what does it need to do? It needs to consume another antioxidant and be reduced. Glutathione, another great example. We already know from some of the studies on Parkinson's and all, that IV glutathione can have phenomenal effects for Parkinson's patients. But look at the mechanism. Glutathione is a tripeptide. We already show from clinical observations and animal experiments that when you give glutathione intravenously, within a minute, it's broken down in the blood to its constituent amino acids. So you no longer have glutathione circulating a minute after you put it in. <clears throat> But what happens? You have three separate energy-consuming transport mechanisms to take each amino acid inside the cell. Then once those three amino acids are inside the cell, you have two ATP-dependent synthetic mechanisms to cleave them together. So in order to get one molecule of glutathione that was inside the blood, inside the cell, by direct IV delivery, you need to consume energy five times. Now the whole point of an antioxidant is to deliver energy. So this is a very counterproductive type of thing. And from my clinical observations with the impact of these, it made sense. I can tell you that before I started working for the company that I work for that makes these liposome products, I refused to believe my own clinical observations for about a year. Uh, there was Klenner, there was Dr. Reardon, and then I think before the last 10 years, I can't imagine many people on the planet having used more IV vitamin C than me. I loved it. Best thing since sliced bread. Nothing that didn't help. The diseases I was able to see that were the same as Klenner, I could do the same thing. So I said, all is good. And then my clinic closed. I got sick. Didn't have my IV vitamin C. I said, what the heck am I going to do now? 
And I just, they said, try this stuff. So I had the box sitting over in the corner. And I said, well, what the heck. I was already taking vitamin C to the point of bowel tolerance, running all around, just miserable. And that time and many other times since, with other people, with myself, I proved to my satisfaction that five to six grams of properly encapsulated liposome vitamin C taken orally had a greater clinical impact than a 50 gram infusion. Even when I saw this happen, I was still in denial. I mean, I'm thinking what you all are thinking right now. How can you put vitamin C directly into the blood at a tenfold higher amount? What's the best the liposomes can do? They can give you 100% absorption and you got 5 grams rather than 50. But that wasn't what the data was telling me. I had a case of 15-year-old girl in Colombia with hemorrhagic dengue fever. Hemorrhagic dengue fever. Ten packets of lipo C over the course of 25, uh, ten packets of the lipo C over the course of 24 hours and she was fine. I said, something's going on here. And then finally I said, idiot, what's different? It's liposomes. Go study liposomes. And I realized that there was 45 years of liposome research out there and I'll summarize for you what I found, but let me say before I go on, <laughs> in no way am I out to undermine intravenous vitamin C. It's a magn magnificent therapy, it will always be. Just remember you have additional options that can get the vitamin C in other areas of the body more readily than intravenous, so use both. But let me tell you, if you're poor, if you don't have a doctor anywhere nearby, it's really great to have something that can give you an equivalent clinical impact just by taking it by mouth. So take both. Remember that IV vitamin C is great for the, inter in for the extracellular spaces. For example, I mean, if you just got IV toxin dumped into your system, what you want is IV vitamin C. You want the vitamin C directly in contact with the toxin. But once the poisoning has been around a while and it starts to get into the cell, you want this liposomal too, so it gets inside the cell. So what do we see with liposomes? Number one, you get a virtually 100% delivery into the blood. But don't confuse this on blood levels. This is 100% delivery into the blood still encapsulated in the liposome. So. If you get a high level in the blood, and you do, and then it starts to go down, you should be able to document it's not coming out of the urine. It's going down because it's going into the cells. Okay, so you can't use the traditional blood level mindset to evaluate or compare an oral liposome encapsulation versus IV or other oral forms. So. <clears throat> Now, I realize I've jumped a little ahead, so I need to give a quick liposome lecture why, why this can be true. A liposome is a little ball of fat. And it's surrounded, it's a lipophospholipid membrane, phosphatidylcholine, that is virtually the same substance as that which your natural cell walls are. And constructed in the same fashion. With... Uh, Hydrophilic on the outside and hydrophobic interacting on the inside. So you have water solubility on the outside and you have fat solubility in the membrane itself. So what happens is when you drop the right type of phosphatidylcholine in an aqueous solution with whatever is in the solution, guess what? It balls up and it encapsulates what was in that solution. And when you do what you need to do to make these things small enough, which you can do, and they get near a cell, they'll do a number of things. They'll pinocytose and open up. They're very deformable. If you actually ever drop oil into water, it won't just be a solid ball. It'll 
squish until it reaches its conformation so it can deform into the cell. Bottom line is, you will get almost 100% absorption into the blood and then you will get a non-energy consuming, big point when you consider the fact that the glutathione molecule IV needed consumption of energy five times to get reconstructed inside the cell, you can get a non-energy requiring delivery inside the cell, into the mitochondria, into the endoplasmic reticulum, and even into the nucleus. Now that's bioavailability. A lot of articles, especially older articles that you read, they equate bioavailability with absorption into the blood. That's not bioavailability. Bioavailability is getting the molecule you're taking in the tissue that you want, in the spot inside the cell that you want, interacting with the target molecule that you want. That's bioavailability. <clears throat> the other things that are very nice and practical that this does is, oh well, oh, <laughs> losing myself here, is you have protection of the payload from digestion. The stomach acts on things in an aqueous environment, breaks them down real quick. When they're covered with fat, they don't get broken down, and conversely, if something that you have inside the liposome is aggravating to the stomach, like ascorbic acid, you don't have stomach upset. So that's a practical point from compliance. The phosphatidylcholine itself has enormous supplemental value. A good quality phosphatidylcholine is strongly anti-atherosclerotic all by itself. Deep intercellular access, energy sparing delivery, uptake by macrophages. And this has been documented well the liposomes get taken up avidly inside the macrophages, and this, as an important part of your immune system, is one of the main reasons by which you can supercharge your immune system by getting these targeted things in there. Now, uh, okay, I mentioned this already. What have they already encapsulated in liposomes? Well, there's not that many products out there that are currently being sold, but I can tell you this is going to, I think, astronomically increase in the next five to ten years. Because they've already encapsulated CEA, carotenoids, GSH, NAC, superoxide dismutase. They've encapsulated insulin and delivered insulin into the blood through an oral mechanism. Why is this not out there yet? Well, I don't know. Follow the money trail. Peptides and proteins. We have some phenomenally bioactive dye and tripeptides out there doing almost mind-boggling, magical type of effects. But guess what? When you take them orally, they get broken down in the stomach. And basically, you have to give them IV, all this. All that will change with liposomes. They even have combinations. Like you can put three or four things in solution. They'll encapsulate all of them. All right, just about coming to the end. So try to remember, number one, the important toxicity of the root canal. And the fact that your therapy is not done, especially for your cancer patient, if that's still present in the mouth. Take my word for it. All therapy is electron repletion. All therapy. So you treat all infections. You use whatever you have to eliminate toxins, but to neutralize them in the process so they don't re-poison the body on the way out and re-annihilate the immune system. Optimize digestion. We talked about that. Eliminate and neutralize the excess iron. And in my opinion, don't take supplemental things such as copper. Optimize vitamin D3 levels. Optimize the calcium status and document that you're doing so. And optimize antioxidant supplementation. Use the IV. Use the liposomal. If you're dealing with gut problems, use regular vitamin C to cause a C flush and keep the toxins flushed out of the gut. That's my book right there. Now, 
Medical and legal considerations. Probably ten more minutes. But very important. I <coughs> did have the unfortunate experience of going through training as a lawyer, so although I'm a baby lawyer and I've never practiced it, I have a few, I think, unique perspectives. <clears throat> Especially in an August group like this, remember number one, it was especially bad ten years ago, but it ain't so great yet. Remember you are still a target. And remember that the more successful you are, the better results you have, the more patience you have, the bigger a target you are. Don't forget that. Remember that, also important, that every one of these sentences is important. Negligence is unnecessary when you're targeted. But I did everything right. But I explained it. Not important. Okay? Remember number three. I saw this happen so much with Dr. Huggins. I had, I had a great ringside seat to a large amount of ugliest, ugliness for a lot of years. Litigants can be and often are harvested just like organs. Even if every patient you think loves you, guess what? When the feds want, they can go through every chart that you own and if you treated thousands of patients, and they'll find five to ten patients and convince them that they had a bad outcome. Okay? It's not just because of a bad result in an unhappy patient. Okay. Now, always be aware of what the mainstream standards of practice are. Even though you're, you're approaching things from a different angle, Remember what the mainstream standards are. And to the best of your ability, don't ignore them. Now, this is where a group like this is going to over time. Other groups like ACAM, to a lesser degree, A4M. When you have a large enough group of medical professionals, physicians who have been standardly trained. In other words, most people here, they have, a, they have a medical degree from a regular medical school in the United States or elsewhere. They passed all the tests. They passed their boards. You learned the normal nut of medicine, and you learned a little more. Okay? So when you have a group like this, once it gets large enough, once the opinions are scientifically documented and there's no way to tell you when it gets large enough. That'll end up in an individual judge's lap. But there'll be a point in time when the number of you get large enough, you're standardly trained, you're looking at all the data, but you have a different conclusion. The whole group has a different conclusion. Then you have a second school of thought that will then ultimately gain the same respect in a court of law, we're not talking science, in a court of law as the mainstreamers. So that at that point in time, a patient can say, uh, I choose just to get IV vitamin C and everything else they're offering and I don't want any chemotherapy and all, and it can be supported. That's the goal. We're not there yet. Finally, Okay. For the sake of credibility, and I don't like to have, it's, it's, like, it's like being worried all year long that the IRS is going to audit you. You know, how many records do I keep, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not trying to get you to be preoccupied with this, but when convenient, when you can, try to get as many traditional continuing education credits as well and build that dossier. Don't uh, even, even if it's online stuff, you don't necessarily have to waste a couple thousand dollars and go to a medical conference for a week that you don't really care about, but you can get medical education credits online in other ways, spend a few bucks, spend a little time, and build up that dossier. 
Another important thing that always comes home to roost when unfortunate, wonderful souls like yourself end up in a court of law is what other things do you charge for that you can't support scientifically with hard documented evidence? And I'm not going to go right here into a pro or con on, on homeopathy, sanum remedies, uh, kinesiology, but I will tell you that I'll have a field day with it in a court of law, especially if uh, the patient racked up another couple thousand dollars worth of bills on treatments like that. So just remember that that puts you a little bit behind the eight ball as well. Again, remember, I'm not, I'm not even here to go into how good or bad or valid those therapies are. I'm just telling you they will be points of contention, especially if you charge for them. Okay. Now, possibly in addition to remembering the root canal, one of the best things you can do for yourself, and, and when I first started talking about this, we didn't even have the technology we have today, is videotape the informed consent. Now, this is not as prohibitive or, 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 or problematic as it might seem. You can have one small spot in the room, you can have your standard form, you can have your, your most trusted uh, nurse or, uh, or assistant flip on the camera, the nurse reads the whole form, do you understand it, the camera is looking at the eyes and everything like that, and then you come in 10 seconds later and say, okay, Mrs. Mrs. Smith, you do understand this point, you do understand that we can't guarantee you anything. We can tell you that the statistics on this is we see this, this, and this. Some people don't improve at all. Uh, others get better, but there's no guarantee of that. And uh, there have been ad bad outcomes and blah, 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 do you understand? Now, that can all be done in five minutes. It's not a time-consuming thing once you set it up. Furthermore, they now have these little memory sticks with 32 gigabytes on them. And you could probably put 10,000 of those on one memory stick. So it doesn't have to consume anything, but I can guarantee you, if they harvest one of your patients, and the lawyer comes knocking on your door, and you say, I got a videotape to show you, you'll be very amazed at how quickly that lawyer loses interest. Everything in a court of law is he said, she said. Okay, well, I, I guaranteed him this, and she understood, blah, blah, blah. Really? She doesn't remember any of that, and, and she thought you told her her vision would be perfect afterwards. Whatever. It's the intimidation of they know they're on videotape. Okay? So, for what it's worth, I would strongly consider, I would strongly recommend to you that you incorporate this into your practice. You'll frustrate the hell out of them. So, and then remember, we already said this before, but whether somebody, something actually works by itself is of no consequence in a court of law. Absolutely zero. You can get a dozen, two dozen, ten dozen patients to come in and say how fantastic they felt after you treated them and no other doctor had ever done that. Irrelevant. Okay? I don't want to bring you down after the rest of the talk, but we're in a pretty ugly world. We're also in an economy now where, guess what? More people want money. And what is one of the remaining frontiers of economic uh, is your lawyer. Okay? So, and I say this from the bottom of my heart. Go out and be the leaders in showing the medical profession how it should be trusting its all too, how it should be treating its all too trusting patients. Thank you. The first annual Reardon IVC and Cancer Symposium was brought to you by the Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International, located at 3100 North Hillside, Wichita, Kansas, USA. 
To learn more about the center and what we have to offer, please visit us on the web at www.brightspot.org.